Chapter 5, The Wanderer's Alienation After a recent lecture in Minnesota, I was asked a special question by the wife of a man who knew he was an E.T. wanderer. Sounding concerned, she told me her husband is sure he's from elsewhere and now has no more doubt, but after this momentous discovery, which he had suspected for years, his life became more difficult, not less. His wife explained that it's been very hard for him to find something worthwhile to do on earth since he feels overcome by a deep sense of aimlessness. In fact, she said, he had to develop an interest in something here and train his mind to get excited about it. Obviously, the knowledge of being an E.T. soul severed his interest in human involvement and dissolved any sense of meaning he previously gained from being in society. As I told his wife, this experience is actually quite common. It's simply an early phase of emotional readjustment. Almost every wanderer I interviewed for my first book had a powerful sense of alienation at some point in their life. Usually, it marked the beginning of their path towards E.T. identity. Many people felt a strong sense of differentness during childhood, despite their friends and loving family. It usually accompanied a vague longing for the stars, for true family, for a long-forgotten home. When the person reached adolescence, their ongoing alienation was further compounded by a very real terror. How will I ever fit into this world and find something I like? Despite the pain and confusion of such feelings, the issue at stake here is easily defined. It's the need for meaningful social engagement. However, the issue is not so easily resolved. How do you fit into a world which you feel is not your own? And more than that, how do you participate in a society that might call you insane if you shared your ideas, then label you a victim of delusion? This misfitting is far more complex than simply some kind of cross-cultural adjustment or living far from home, as with cross-border immigration. The wanderer's alienation is like an identity badge pinned to the heart, part of the very substance of all his or her experience on Earth. It is not easily dismissed, nor should it be. This alienation is like a flashing light above the gateway to our remembrance, as well as the cross we've chosen to bear as a responsibility for the honor and privilege of serving on a planet in such dire need of love light. Discomfort is just part of the job. When I first discovered that this kind of extreme personal alienation and differentness was common among those who claimed to be wanderers and star people, I knew it would set off alarms among the so-called experts. As the conventional explanation for this most unconventional sense of identity, the standard psychological response runs something like this. Quote, yes, of course, they obviously call themselves ETs because it gives them comfort and self-importance, making their painful feelings of social maladjustment easier to bear. End quote. If you agree with this interpretation, you'll probably also believe there's no such thing as ET souls, only ordinary humans with ordinary emotional problems trying to make something special out of it. This opinion is at the core of the skeptic's position, and it certainly does have some merit. In some cases, I certainly agree. Yet, despite their merit and clear mental logic, such psychological interpretations cannot ever be proven. First of all, not everyone with social alienation claims to be an ET, and not all those who claim to be ET souls feel such alienation. Just because a radical belief brings comfort and self-esteem does not prove that the notion was cooked up to bring comfort and self-esteem. Just because we feel better knowing that Earth revolves around the sun doesn't mean it's not true. Just because people seek meaning in life and find meaning in a belief in God doesn't mean that their belief is but fantasy. It may seem inane to say, but human belief in God does not prove there is no God. As we reason this way and draw out their argument, the logic of die-hard skeptics becomes folly. Furthermore, not all wanderers are comforted by their recognition of being E.T. As in the story above, some people feel more disoriented by this self-discovery. This so-called compensatory delusion, apparently compensating for some sort of emotional deficiency or palliating an assumed psychological conflict, often brings more life challenges and inner conflict. So, then we cannot argue that it is an emotionally based notion designed to quell inner discontent. Actually, all the many psychologizing arguments really don't take us that far. It's just the old chicken and egg question. Does childhood alienation create the need to imagine being from elsewhere, 
Or does the reality of being an E.T. soul since birth naturally generate feelings of alienation? I'll be the first to admit that believers can't prove their point. But, to be fair, neither can the skeptics. Oh well. Now that we've finished that little game, let's all get on to more important questions. Can psychological dynamics coexist with transcendental reality? Does the field of human psychology explain all facets of human experience? Without going too far into the approaching dense thicket of debate, let me simply say this. More and more people are telling me that the knowledge they've gained from their subjective spiritual process has far greater value to them than the current beliefs of so-called experts. On anyone's scale of mental health, the majority of those who say they're ET souls will be judged stable, intelligent, high-functioning, and willing to listen to opposing views. Of course, psychological explanations have their place and their import in understanding human behavior and motivations, but they don't tell the whole story. Our presumably advanced civilization should be enlightened enough by now to realize that human beings are far deeper than human psychology. As a teenager, I often consulted the I Ching, or Book of Changes, an ancient Chinese oracle and fortune-telling system. In my innocence, I plainly asked, Who am I? since at that time I actually imagined such a deep query could be answered by a book. Nevertheless, my innocence was well received. The book did point me towards deeper self-understanding, a vision that did, however, take many years to grow. The answer I received from the I Ching was hexagram number 56, Lu, the Wanderer. Are you surprised? You should already know God works in strange ways. Anyway, here's one translation of that answer. The Wanderer. Success through smallness, perseverance brings good fortune to the wanderer. The meaning of the time of the wanderer is truly great. Whatever greatness may exhaust itself upon, this much is certain. It loses its home. He who has few friends, this is the wanderer. What the I Ching says about Lu, which is just one of 64 six-lined or symbol hexagrams in the book, is relevant to that other type of wanderer, the E.T. kind. They too have lost their home, and some psychologists would add that they've lost their minds as well. Moreover, wanderers have also lost their greatness, which is much harder to accept. Like sad eagles with clipped wings, they're full of vigor but unable to fly. The husband unwilling to return to normal society after discovering his E.T. roots was probably suffering this same type of exhaustion of greatness, the dull pain of knowing he is not who he used to be and that the glory of spirit he once knew is apparently beyond reach. No wonder he and his wife had to train his mind to get excited about social engagement. He was suffering spiritual deflation, which is common to both wanderers as well as those who return from deeper states of meditation, near-death experiences, and vivid out-of-body journeys. It is simply the pain of interdimensional readjustment, re-entering a more disharmonious vibratory environment. So... What's a good ET to do about all this? Really, the best advice would be to meditate every day. But how many of us are really willing to do it? Short of this, it seems important to realize that alienation is normal and just part of the landscape. I admit the reality and the influence of various psychological factors, and I agree that counseling can be useful. Wanderers, like everyone else, often have a different childhood and usually have emotional conflicts of one sort or another. But dealing with alienation goes far beyond the analysis and healing of childhood wounds. It's really part of a subtle process of making peace with living at a lower density of light than that to which we are accustomed. Our adjustment is thus psycho-spiritual, both psychological and spiritual, not one or the other. It is also a matter of increased self-acceptance, taking responsibility for our spiritual longing and confusion, than having the will to forge constructive activity in this world. And, by the way, moving beyond spiritual deflation usually leads to greater dedication to some form of service on earth. If you do consider yourself a visitor, then realize you chose to be here. It's neither an accident nor your prison. Then ask yourself this, why did I choose to be here, and what might now bring me fulfillment? It is useless to try to force yourself to get in step with society. It's far better to learn your own steps. And don't be afraid to feel different. If you really are, then that's just the way it is.